the Institute for the Study of Peak States presents the second International Psychoimmunology and Psychobiology Research Symposium. The pathogen causing Kundalini symptoms, presented by Dr. Mary Pelliser and Julien Roux. So, our institute's uh, founder, Dr. Grant McFedridge, is fond of saying that research rarely follows a logical linear path forward. Our next two presenters will not only share their current research project, uh, but will also take you behind the scenes through some of the twists and turns leading to their discoveries. Dr. Mary Pellissier is the Medical Director of Applied Research at the Institute, and Julian Rue is one of our certified trauma therapists. They are both part of the research team at the Institute and doing research in psychobiology and psychoimmunology is definitely a passion for them both. Kundalini is not a topic that either of them thought they would study, but it sort of grabbed them both by the throat recently and demanded they take a long, hard look. So here they are to tell the story of the pathogen causing Kundalini symptoms. So thank you, Mary and Julian. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. There we go. In a darkened room, a man sits alone. His body is swept by muscle spasms, indescribable sensations and sharp pain in his feet. Sweeps over his back and neck, his skull feels as if it will burst. Inside his head, he hears roaring sounds and a high-pitched whistling. Then suddenly, a sunburst floods his inner being. His hands burn. He feels his body tearing within. Then he laughs and is overcome with bliss. This passage is from the introduction of Dr. Lee Sinella's book on Kundalini. There are several different models to explain the phenomenon of Kundalini. In the yogic model, Kundalini is seen as an energy that usually resides asleep at the base of the spine. When this energy is awakened, it rises slowly up the spinal canal to the top of the head. This may mark the beginning of a process of enlightenment. There are certainly many spiritual seekers who follow this yogic model and who are searching for this enlightenment and are willing to endure the symptoms of Kundalini with a sought after reward at the end. A second model I will call the Bentoff Sinella model. Dr. Sinella, an ophthalmologist and psychiatrist who wrote the now classic book Kundalini psycho Psychosis or Transcendence. He preferred to use the term first proposed by Itzhak Bentoff. He liked the term physio kundalini to leave out what he called the vague mysticism and strange mythology surrounding kundalini. Today, the symptom complex is also often referred to as the kundalini syndrome. Now, Sonella wrote his book based on published reports from diverse cultures and his own cases. In it, he lays out a summary of the characteristic signs and symptoms of the rise of the Kundalini. He found marked uniformity in the description of this Kundalini process from widely disparate traditions, including Christian mystics, Sufi masters, and yogi adepts. The symptom patterns and types of sensations were quite similar. In Appendix E of Sonella's book, he has the following list of questions he used for research participants. They were formulated as a guide to physicians and researchers who were exploring the psychotic-like states that may accompany the physio-kundalini process. I just want to share with you some of the, these research questions that he would ask and the symptom, basically a review of symptoms, so that you get an understanding if you've never had encountered this, what these are like for some people. 
So the questions were auditory. Do you hear sounds such as a tone, music, hissing, roaring, thunder, drumming, or the sound of cymbals when no such sounds are produced outside your head? Visual questions. Do you have visualizations or visual hallucinations? Do you experience light inside your head or body or see the environment as illuminated by other than normal means? Questions about temperature, which are key. Do you sense unusual heat or cold in your body or on your skin? And does it move from place to place or stay in one area? Also, he had questions about sensations. Do you have sensations, perhaps tickling, tingling, vibrating, itching, crawling within your body or on your skin? Questions about movements. Are there spontaneous involuntary positioning of the limbs, fingers, or body? Are they jerky? Are these jerky, smooth, sinuous, rhythmic, possibly spasmodic or violent? Involuntary body movements. Do you inadvertently cry out, grunt, yell, or scream? Or do you ever stare into space for long periods of time or appear wild-eyed? Listening to those lists of symptom questions, imagine how frightening it might be if you were experiencing these things with absolutely no context for understanding or support in coping with them. This is why a full-on kundalini awakening can lead to a spiritual emergency. So that is my very brief overview of the kundalini phenomenon and two prominent explanatory models. The classic yogic model that says that kundalini is a normally dormant energy, which when awakened begin, begins this process of enlightenment. And the bent off Sinella physio kundalini model that thinks of kundalini as a physiological cycle or process co coexistent with experiences of kundalini energy and part of an evolution toward higher states of consciousness. To be clear, in this presentation, we are not talking about kundalini from a spiritual perspective, nor do we mean to disparage anyone's beliefs. In this presentation, Julie and I are proposing another model to understand the phenomenon of kundalini. Whoops. Our research into this phenomenon relates to the symptoms that arise for many people and we hypothesize a different explanation when seen through an ISPS psychoimmunology model. We are proposing a pathogen mediated process in the primary cell, which plays out as these various symptoms in the body. Before we go further though, let's go back in time to the beginning of Julian's Kundalini adventure. Take it away, Julian. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, um, I was seeking spiritual advancement, enlightenment, and, and to feel uh, great. So let me just put myself there. Okay. And so I started going to a lot of personal development, shamanic and spiritual workshop, and was following a lot of spiritual teachers. Uh, with all of these, I was now feeling spiritually advanced, powerful, and I was having new extraordinary, extraordinary abilities. So I had now a soul family, friends, a group to belong to, who can relate to how I feel and that seek the similar goal as mine. So enlightenment, to be in inner peace and to be in control of my life. But all of this was just making me more egocentric, was feeding my need to be special, to feel powerful. In reality, it was making me avoid facing my own suffering, my lack of self-esteem and repressed internal self-blame. It was a way for me to cope with the reality and how I was feeling internally. 
I noticed that a lot of people in those workshops seemed to be like me in deny of how powerless I was feeling in my life. So that's why I was looking to feel powerful and in control. So, thanks. so on this journey, I was trying a lot of new healing modalities, such as Kundalini activation. In a retrospect now, I realized that me and probably most of those people were and still are triggered into Kundalini symptoms without even realize, realizing it. Kundalini was seen as such a great, great thing, you know, and the way to be enlightened. Great job, you are now on the, one of the chosen, chosen ones. That's how I felt and how people around me was telling me. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Julian. Now, I want to pick up the story and go back to the ISPS and review the ISPS view on Kundalini. In the subcellular psychobiology manual, Grant talks about what he means by kundalini, which is a small area on the spine that radiates heat as it slowly moves up from the pelvic area, triggering traumatic feelings, spiritual experiences, and an inability to sleep. Grant's conclusion from this experience is that Although many people believe that Kundalini is a mark of spiritual advancement, we have not seen any convincing evidence of this. Back in the early 1990s, Grant became very interested in the Kundalini phenomenon because his partner at that time had a full on Kundalini awakening, which was horrific for her. On his journey, searching for answers in order to help her, he met with dozens of people with the Kundalini issue. In fact, he went to a conference, he told me, on Kundalini with about 500 participants, and he talked to many, many people. His conclusion from this basically experiential research, talking to people and looking at how this was playing out in people's lives, was that it wasn't leading to spiritual enlightenment but was a pathologic process that often caused years or even decades of suffering for these people. In general, people experiencing Kundalini were, and I quote Grant, really messed up. So as he was searching for clues to crack the puzzle, he says, I got lucky. And he got lucky because he was triggered himself into Kundalini. So now he was able to become his own lab rat. And he found that the essential problem was the emotion of blame, specifically blame in the body consciousness. As he writes in the uh, ISPS handbook, Subcellular Psychobiology, the cause is simple. The body brain is blaming all the rest of the being for its own issues. Eliminating Kundalini is also simple. Heal the body's brain's feeling of blame using trauma healing or projection techniques. Now, with that under our belt, let's get back to Julian's story and what happened when he encountered Grant and the Institute. Julian? Hi. So, I did a trauma therapist training in, in 2018. And that's when I realized how much I was in denial, being egocentric and how much internal suffering I had. So this training literally popped my bubble of delusional happiness, control, power, and feeling, spe feeling special I had, ouch. <laughs> and so no one told me that would happen. I just realized it, it because this training was asking me to tune into myself all the time for 30 days. And as part of this training, I healed some of the Kundalini I had noticed, but I didn't do it properly because in, in retrospect, I didn't really care to heal it. After all of this and the training, 
I started, started to feel very bad for almost two years. It's only now that all of the puzzle pieces are falling into place and that I realize the impact that Kundalini had on my life. I was feeling dep depressed, experiencing a lot of highs and lows, blaming myself all the time, blaming others, procrast procrastinating on a lot of basic tasks and others. I was too often triggered into negative emotion and feeling overwhelmed. My body was never calm and I was having a lot of mood swing. Back to the research story. Thanks, Julian. Psychoimmunology entered the picture about a year ago when Julian and I had a joint client with chronic unrelenting panic attacks. And we were only successful in helping her temporarily and then her debilitating, debilitating symptoms would return. During a consultation with Grant and Kirsten, we actually found a pathogen that was secreting a toxin. And interestingly, the emotional tone of this toxin was blame. This was interesting because of Grant's insight back in the 90s that blame was the key emotion causing Kundalini symptoms. In our client's case, she used simple trauma healing and was able to eliminate the blame and her symptoms greatly improved. Well, that was interesting and certainly a relief for our client, but the Kundalini issue is thought to be uncommon. So I tucked it away in my brain box and thought nothing more of it. Time passed and our story picks up again only one month ago. On a Skype chat with Julian, he was talking about his ongoing struggle to heal. And I asked him a key question. I asked him, are you sure you don't still have Kundalini? Which led to us both doing a deep dive into the whole Kundalini phenomenon and our current discovery. Let's have Julian explain. So after noticing I was still having Kundalini symptoms, I started doing research on it. And the more I was researching on it, the more I was realizing now, uh, oh, I had been affected by it all along for three years. Doing this research, developing a process for it and testing it on me was really interesting because I was able to track what, what was happening and how I was feeling in real time. It was not easy because of the self-blame and procrastination I was experiencing, but I made it through the end alive and feeling better than ever. One thing that had puzzled us was how the pathogen and its toxin was causing all these Kundalini symptoms, the ones Julian experienced and the ones I talked of earlier documented by Sanella. We still are not sure and have more investigation to do, but this is what we have found so far. And this diagram here you're seeing is a Julian's lovely little illustration of what we're finding. The pathogen, which we think is an amoeba, is located inside the primary cell in a place that we call the nuclear core. And it seems like this pathogen likes to attach itself to the chain structure. And fascinatingly enough, the chain overlays onto the spine. We already know that. What we have also found so far in clients with this issue is that the location of the amoeba on the chain in their primary cell roughly correlates to the location of the hot spot on the spine. What's more, is that the chain is attached above and below, as you can see here, to the structure, the Merkaba structure, also in the nuclear core. And the points of the Merkaba are linked with the various triune brain consciousness. So what we're thinking is that there may be a correlation between which part of the Merkaba the toxin touches and the types of symptoms. 
And we also think that symptom severity is probably correlated to the amount of blame toxin being released. For sure, more research to do. But let's go back to Julian, my favorite lab rat. Yes, but I like it. I mean, I'm a volunteer for that. Since I have ill the Kundalini pathogen in me, I feel really different, really, really interesting because all the safe blame I used to experience that I always thought was a normal thing to experience for any person is now fully gone. And I'm not blaming people either anymore. I'm owning my action and taking responsibility too. I'm not triggered all the time. I have, I, I have this under, underlying sense of happiness and optimism now, and I don't really procrastinate anymore. Before I was always in a sort of chaos, having highs and lows that was making me, making me so deep, depressed. Being overwhelmed for no reason is now gone. Really like I feel calm most of the time. I feel a sense of stability of being me and a sense of inner peace calm that before I was only able to experience temporarily, even though I had the inner peace state. Thank you, Julian. Over the last month, and get this, this has been only over the last month, Julian and I have been moving fast to look at this further. Because of my awareness was now tuned into Kundalini, I started to notice this problem in many of my current clients. And when I actually screened for it and asked questions, I found the problem in at least half of my clients to some degree. And in some, it was actually a huge problem, making their healing of other issues much harder. And I hadn't realized it. So for me, I am now very suspicious that Kundalini symptoms may be far more common than we had thought. And I think that kundalini symptoms occur along a spectrum of severity, from mild symptoms all the way to full-blown spiritual emergency. This table here that you're seeing shows what happened with four clients before and after treatment. As you will notice in clients A and C, their symptoms after they healed all the blame basically went completely away. Their SUDS rating went down to zero. Now in clients B and D, their symptoms decreased, but I suspect that they still have more blame toxin to clear. In fact, focus in here on client D and let's look at his sleep issues. So if you look before he ranked his sleep issues at an eight, after he had healed what he thought was all the blame, just really unchanged. He sent me the following message just two hours ago. This is like late breaking news. He texted, you were right. I still had blame going on in my body brain. It was blaming my mind brain. I healed that last night and slept all the way through the night for the first time in months, yay. So this really demonstrates powerfully for me what Grant was sharing earlier in his talk. When you find the right stuff to heal, things can really change super fast. I just wanna address now an issue that we have conveniently ignored so far in our proposed psychoimmunology model. And that is, what about the enlightenment that at least some people may reach at the end of this Kundalini process? So our current suspicion is that some people do reach a higher state of consciousness but we don't really use that term enlightenment, but we would call this a peak state of consciousness. So I think for some people, maybe a lot of people, we haven't really done an exhaustive review, actually do get to a peak state of consciousness at the end of their Kundalini process with all these symptoms. What we suspect the Kundalini process is 
what we suspect is happening is that the Kundalini process may get triggered uh, when a person inadvertently triggers trauma at a key developmental event. And we suspect what then, that when this key developmental event is fully healed, that it may unlock a peak state of consciousness. Which one we don't yet know. Certainly a lot of more research to explore here. But at that key developmental event, this pathogen may well be intertwined and also get stimulated, starts to release lots of brain toxin and all hell breaks loose. So moving forward, we have open research questions. So the, and these are what they are. <clears throat> The first one is what is what is Kundalini uh, energy from a peak state's perspective? And is this part of an, a known peak state of consciousness? That's basically what I was talking about before. Second big question, are there other conditions where the Kundalini symptom complex is playing a role? Now, I, for one, have a high suspicion, for example, that if we start to explore the condition of fibromyalgia, that at least some of those clients may have this phenomenon going on. So it's a very active um, an area of active interest for me. Also, if we consider certain cases of, of anxiety and panic attacks, sometimes we find clients with anxiety that even with what we know about anxiety, we just can't get them to resolution. And I'm wondering whether Kundalini is playing a role as the primary cause or an underlying mitigating factor. And finally, our last open research question is, when the pathogen is completely eliminated, does that make it possible, does that make it impossible for a person to experience blame? Wouldn't that be cool? The last thing in moving forward I want to talk about is that um, for all of you listening and especially for therapists out there, possibly clients, is I urge you to be really suspicious that your clients may have this issue at some level and actually screen for it. So the key symptoms that we found for screening are is the person, you or your client, feeling overwhelmed by emotions and sensations, which may lead and is having problems healing themselves because of this overwhelm? The second screening question would be, is there a hot spot somewhere on your spine? Now, this isn't universal. The Remember back to client D, he actually doesn't feel a hot spot, but he does have pain in his spine, which reduced with healing the blame. Third screening question has to do with sleep. Are they having problems with sleep? And the fourth is about blame. Is there, are they having lots of blame towards themselves or others or feel it from others? Or if they look out at the world, do they notice a lot of blame, blaming going on between people? Those are really the screening questions. Lastly, Julie and I are continuing this journey and you can contact either of us. You can email me at, uh, as shown there or Skype me. My Skype handle is mary.pelisir. There is Julian's contact information in his website. And amazingly enough, I'm going to stop sharing. You have questions, so. Yes, and in case there are questions. Yes. We've got a yes. few minutes and we do have a few questions. Uh, so the first question was, is healing from the pathogen actually leading to a spiritual state? The answer to that is no, as far as we can tell. Healing the, well, well, first of all, what I wanna say is right now the process we have is only healing the toxin. So it's just healing the blame toxin. We know how to do that with um, just with simple trauma healing. It's not actually clearing the pathogen. 
that is our ongoing research and Julie and I are furiously working at finding uh, the pathogen fully and utilizing the techniques that Grant talked about earlier, psychoimmunology te techniques to eliminate the pathogen. I don't think, well, Julian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that just healing the pathogen or the toxin will lead to a peak state of consciousness necessarily. But you may feel a lot better, as Julian pointed out, and my clients are noticing, just because all of that trauma is gone. So I think the key is going to be unlocking that key developmental event. And this does not heal that. That would have to be healed separately to unlock and get to this peak state of consciousness that we think is there. And also, because we are not experiencing so much overwhelm, overwhelm and also not having so much trigger, triggers happening in us all the time, then we experience more a CPL state, so calm, peaceful, and light. So we can say it's a peak state, but it's not a peak state. You feel like clear, no trauma kind of. So it feels like a peak state, but no. Yeah, I can actually add to that a little bit as well. I was at a science of consciousness uh, conference last year and someone there was talking about Kundalini as well. And he was saying he went through, you know, two years of hell, just constantly doing some practices that effectively is healing all of the trauma that's coming up. And so my hypothesis would be, it's not getting rid of the pathogen that gets you the, the, the peak state. It's actually all of the trauma healing that you finally do after years of, of healing that will get you to the peak state would be my guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, another question is very similar around, do you actually eliminate the Kundalini parasites? Do you have already answered that question? And do, or do you do something else that actually makes it calmer? So I guess you've kind of effectively. Yeah. So that. right now, what, now, right now, what we know how to do is get rid of the blame toxin just by simple trauma healing. And we hope in the near future to have a psychoimmunology process to actually eliminate the pathogen. And we were suspicious that, uh, there's a possibility that it can get re-triggered after we clear all the, the blame that the pathogen may start to produce it again. So we really want to find a way to get rid of that pathogen and we're hot on the trail. Uh, so there's a, a question here from Keith Brown around blame versus regret, uh, that there may be some useful distinctions there. Do you have any comments around that? Yeah, for me, um, blame has a level of judgment to it. Now, I mean, the other distinction uh, is blame versus responsibility. So you can, I mean, if you've done something, there's this sense of, yes, I did that, I'm responsible for that, but without the, the kind of um, uh, judgment that blame does. As far as regret, regret um, I haven't really thought of that. I don't know, Julian, do you have a sense now that you've healed your brain? It's totally separate for me. Okay. I never, it was not regret, it was really blaming. Like really, I was like, I'm against something, against myself, against order. It's like really like, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Edward's asking uh, Julian, what it was you did um, before the Kundalini? Uh, were you healing trauma therapy or, or peak spates? And whatever it was that you did earlier when you were trying to address this, what was effective about it and what was not effective? So I was doing, in fact, the, the process that we currently have and can help people with Kundalini, the one with the blame, but I didn't do it fully because I was triggered into Kundalini and because maybe I, I wanted to, to keep being special or being uh, like that so i didn't fully finish it that's why but i did the current one okay um so we've probably reached time there are a couple more questions we're glad you can probably answer those uh with a written response so thank you very much and yes we'll get ready for our next thank you up. everybody thanks shane thank you for watching for more information visit peakstates.com